Welcome to this year's IE Awards event uh, and this webinar on Energy for the Future. This year marks the 11th anniversary of the IAE Awards, and based on the success of last year's virtual events, we are thrilled to bring you another series of inspiring speakers to support you with becoming a greener business. The aim is to engage organizations with different environmental initiatives to inspire, influence, and share best practice. The program will culminate in the IAE Awards on 10 a.m. on the 14th of October. This has continued to be an unsettling year for businesses, communities, and individuals. The health and sustainability of our environment has never been so critical. The climate crisis and loss of biodiversity has further been exacerbated by the economic, health, and social challenges created by COVID-19. The pandemic has markedly changed business practices for the long term. We believe changing working practices to incorporate environmental decisions into the very heart of our organizations is vital to build resilience and create strong, sustainable businesses. By running our events online, we're hoping to bring people together, share learnings, and be an example of how events can run sustainably in the future too. If you'd like to attend any other events this week, there is still time to register your place online at the IIE website. So just the running order for today, so obviously the welcomes and introductions, uh, followed by the presentations. There'll be a questions and answers, which we'll do right at the end of both presentations, and then we'll be announcing today's award winner for best carbon reduction. Throughout the rest of the week, we'll be running further events. So tomorrow morning, the events on how your business can make biodiversity net gains with Dr. Julia Baker, biodiversity technical specialist at Belfort BT Construction Services UK, who has designed and implemented biodiversity net gain for a variety of infrastructure developments, including large and small scale for the transport, housing, and power sectors, and is the lead author for the UK's good practice principles on biodiversity net gain. And Dr. Nick White. Principal Advisor, Net Gain at Natural England. Nick works across governments, national and local, and with developers, NGOs, and academia to advance policy, practice, and standards around net gain, which is biodiversity, natural capital, and environmental. On Wednesday's event, How to Use Water in the Future, with Barbara Hale, Head of Water Efficiency Engagement at the UK's leading water efficiency, water efficiency NGO, WaterWise, and Ben Earl, Director of Sustainability, Energy, and Water Efficiency, the utility consultancy skewed, where he is the leading where he is leading on key partnerships across various sectors. So if you haven't had a chance to and you're looking uh, to, to attend more events, please sign up to these events. Very informative and very useful uh, for businesses. So uh, leading on to today, so today's presenters, uh, first of all, it will be Mark Mayrick, uh, head of Smart Grids and PPAs for Ecotricity. Mark's main efforts are concentrated on enabling grid scale battery storage deployment aggregated with other assets in a virtual power plant so as to enable ecotricity to be able to flex its power position in response to the needs of the grid and the market. That'll be followed by a presentation from myself. My name is David Knight. I'm the environmental consultant for PECT. I'm working on projects across the UK supporting a wide range of clients from the SME, public and third sectors. Part of my role is working with this, within the investors in the environment as, a, um, uh, as an auditor to support and work with businesses in developing an environmental management system. The other half of my job is, a, is an energy auditor where I've attended sites across the UK working with many organizations to help them understand their energy demands, their energy needs, and what opportunities exist for them to uh, make changes in order to actually reduce their energy consumption, ultimately leading to cost savings, but also reducing their carbon footprint. So first of all, I'd like to welcome Mark Merrick to the stand uh, and ask him to, um, to, to uh, start today's proceedings. So over to you, Mark. And just say you're on mute, Mark. I think I need a T-shirt that says you're on mute. Um, yes, this afternoon I'm going to be talking about um, why having a lot of renewables can be problematic for a system. And it's quite a topical conversation at the moment, given everything you've probably been hearing in the press about um, renewable energy and gas prices and um, how that impacts on our energy prices. Um, so, what I'm going to talk about is first of all how our um, generation mix has evolved this century. Um, how do renewables affect the energy price? Um, where interconnectors come in to that mix and actually what they do? Um, what the transmission challenges are that we have in the UK? And then I'm going to talk a little bit about storage at the end and, and why that's important. 
So I'm going to start off with just a little um, overview of what the UK grid's like, because it's quite uh, how it's designed, because it's quite important to uh, understand some of the challenges we have. So we've got a high voltage grid, and you need high voltage really for energy efficiency purposes, and that moves most of the power at the greatest distances, and that's at 400 kV, and that's typically comes down, uh, brings in all the big generating plant. As it starts to get more local, you get it, the power gets stepped down through a transformer to 275 kV, and once again, as you get onto the DNO networks, uh, sorry, di there's distributed network operators like UKPN or um, uh, Southern Electric or uh, Western Power Distributions. We've all got a DNO, and uh, those are the people you go to if you get get a power cut. And you get the power gets stepped down to 132 kV, which deals with most of the factories and um, light industry, and then ultimately down to 11 kV for um, domestic. Um, and it's important to remember this because at any point on this network, we can have um, congestion and constraint challenges. But with that in mind, I'm going to just give you an overview of what's happened to the generation mix um, and we'll be able to see what's been going on with the, in the UK recently. So if you go back to the beginning of the century, we basically only had three types of generation. We had coal, gas and nuclear. And that's coal in the red, gas in the blue and nuclear in the yellow. And I can't see the whole graph because all of our names are over the end of it, which is making, oh, let's see if I can move, oh, there we go. Um, but as, you, as we start to go through um, 2010, the picture starts to change and you see more uh, colors coming into the mix. So that by now we've got sitting on the top that um, orangey color. Um, we've got less gas than we used to have. We've got no coal uh, worth mentioning. And we've got bits and pieces of solar, which you can see coming in in all those summer months. Those are the orange uh, bits um, pretty much in the middle of each year, which is when obviously the sun shines mostly. Uh, the greens wind and nuclear is not as much as it was, but it's still there and an important part of the base load mix. Um, the sort of brownie orange on the top of everything is the interconnectors. And I'll explain to you why that's going to be uh, important. One trend you might be able to notice is actually there's less power being generated than there used to be. And that includes the uh, interconnector power that we bring in. Um, and that's because um, we've been becoming more efficient with energy usage. And um, in 2012, the EU Energy Efficiency, Direct Efficiency Directive was launched, and we've seen a sort of steady drop off in um, peak demand through all that time. Obviously, 2020 was especially um, a, a, a bit of an outlier because um, demand dropped off a lot, and we'll talk about that in a bit. But there you see, this is, this is a broad mix, but there's a lot, the underlying message is there's a lot more renewable energy on the system than there was. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide is just to give you an idea of August this year. <clears throat> August um, is not always a very windy month, and it was even less windy than we'd have expected. We got about, uh, in our own fleet, about probably 50% of the wind we expected to get, wind generation. Again, you can see how coal has disappeared, that's the red, and <clears throat> uh, interconnectors have come in more, which is that broad, uh, deeper orange color. Um, there's solar getting more and more and uh, wind, as I said, getting more and more. And there's a little bit of hydro. We don't have a big hydro resource in this country, unfortunately. Um, there's one really important form of hydro, which I'm going to talk about later, called pump hydro. But by and large, we've got just got some run of river dotted around the country. So that's the picture. Why does that cause us a problem? This is, um, you can see, all of you can see this anytime you want. It's from a website called Gridwatch. And if you type in Gridwatch, you'll be able to see what's going on at any point um, in the day. So as you can see, that left-hand dial showed that um, this was done on, I think it was Thursday, uh, 10 o'clock in the morning. We had about 32, 33 gig of um, demand, and that's the top left dial. And we were meeting that. Most, if you renew the renewable and the carbon neutral summary sort of dials, so ignore them. But we're meeting that you can see the mix was pretty much a um, bit of nuclear 
bit of gas, 44%, well, a lot of gas, actually. Um, a tiny bit of biomass. Uh, wind doing 20%, which was reasonable. But that amount of wind, uh, 7 gig, just to give you some context, we can, on a good day, generate about 15 gig of wind if, if everything's uh, blowing everywhere. And of course, yeah, it's solar at 6% in October, that's fairly respectable, and um, a tiny bit of coal. And then you can see all, along the bottom all the interconnectors, and I'm going to show you a map of the interconnectors to show you uh, where they are, what they're doing, and um, why they're important to us. Um, you'll see IC France, that one dead middle bottom is nil, and that's the one that caught fire recently in Ashford. And that's why that's doing nil. I see two is um, an adjacent um, French interconnector from around the same area. It started uh, at the beginning of this year. Um, I see Ned is a, it's called um, Brit Ned. It tends to come and go. It's had some it's had some challenges. Um, a couple of those are Irish ones, and uh, I see NL. I believe is the new. A Norwegian interconnector. The grid's been um, grid's been testing it lately just to make sure everything works properly, um, and that, that's going to be an important new source of um, interconnectivity for us. Uh, next slide, please. Now, this is typically the challenge we have as a wind generator. So, what I've done is I've shown you a forecast of wind on the twenty eighth of October last year, um, and the good thing is on the 28th of October, you've got a pretty good idea what's going to be happening on the 29th of October. And that's why the, the band between, um, you can see that yellow and white line, and then you can see some sort of gray shading around it. That's pretty much the range of wind we would have expected at that moment, day ahead. But of course, the problem is, as you start to look two weeks ahead, um, the range of wind possibilities absolutely widens out. Um, and there you can see on the right the um, how much wind there is. So on that day in October, we we're getting pretty close to max wind um, at, at 14, close to 14 anyway. But the problem was, was that we could also see that the likelihood was when we look at all the mix of arrays, and this is, those lines are a mix of all the forecasting arrays that give us some sense of the probability of wind turn up or not, is we could see that from the 3rd of November, uh, the wind was going to drop off. And that means two things. It means one, if we're not getting wind, probably a lot of other people in the country aren't getting wind, which means that the wind we're expecting, the generation we're expecting, we have to go out and buy in the market for those moments when we're not getting it to make sure we're matching our demand because the grid requires you to match your demand every half hour if you're a supplier. So when everybody's not getting wind, people start buying power and the prices start to go up. And not only that, they become a lot more volatile. So as you can see, what was sort of moving along at sort of a, at reasonable levels became a lot more spikier once we got to, you can see that those big, first big spike, I think it's, um, I can't see the grid, but it, it was around the sort of 5th, 5th of November. And then we saw another one on 6th of November. And that volatility of spot prices can cause is what causes uh, real problems for a supplier because they're having to sometimes buy, um, you know, power up at 150. And as you know, um, in recent weeks when there's been no wind and gas has been so expensive, we've been buying power as much as 3,300 pounds for a half hour. And that is um, incredibly expensive. It's, these are prices like that I've never seen before. I've, I've got to be honest, and I've been, um, trading in the power market since it first liberalized in 1999. So what this slide's supposed to show you is that when uh, we don't have a lot of wind, we do have price problems. And that's because the UK is essentially, if you think back to that generation mix, we're basically a, a wind and a gas country. Um, and this then will probably make you think, well, have we got into this position where we're so dependent on one situation, one, one fuel or the other, if I can call wind a fuel. Um, next slide, please. Now I mentioned the interconnectors because what the interconnectors do is they help dampen vol price volatility because if your wind doesn't blow, but you can bring the power in from the continent, that's great because it means that you don't have to 
uh, depend on that really expensive gas plant to set your price. So if you just take a moment to look at that, you can see EFA, which is the old interconnector. It's not much more than basically a bit of copper wire, if I'm absolutely honest. Um, someone dropped an anchor in it in 2016 and managed to knock it out. It's that sensitive. Um, so that's the one that goes into Ashford, those parallel lines there. And I think one of them actually goes through a Eurotunnel. Um, EFA 2 is the new one, two gigawatts down at the bottom. Um, then there's another one that's going to go off the Cotentin Peninsula into Devon uh, in 2022, 1.4 gigawatts. Britain had the one I said is a bit unreliable. That's one going from um, sort of North Kent to uh, the Netherlands, one gig. Uh, we've got one planned into Denmark, Viking Link. And then one that's just testing at the moment is the NCN, 1.4 gig up to, um, and that's a really long one actually, up to Norway. And as you can see, there's some others mooted, maybe one further north in Norway to Scotland, maybe one even to Iceland. And then um, those ones to um, Ireland are quite important. They go both ways at different times, um, depending on who's got who's got short who's short wind and who's got excess power. Um, so as I say, if you're able to get power in through the interconnector at a time when your wind isn't blowing, it can help stop prices going up too high. Next slide, please. Um, and just to reiterate that. The black line here is the amount of wind, and this was taken in July last uh, last July. And that little stack of colours on top is what all the different interconnectors I've just been talking about were doing at different points in time. So as you can see, every time the wind goes up, our import through the interconnectors comes down. That's very exaggeratedly. You can see on the right that big spike there, the 29th of July, the French interconnector more or less shut off. Um, we very rarely see the interconnector in these recent months coming the other way. In other words, all those colours below the line show power export, and that's us exporting power through to um, Ireland. But everything else above that line is us importing from the continent through one or the other of the links we've just been talking about. And um, you get some sense of uh, how high it gets to when uh, we don't have a lot of wind blowing and how low it gets to when we do have wind blowing. And that was just to uh, show how much important interconnectivity is. You think about Germany, who's got a lot of renewables, but Germany's interconnected on every side. Germany can switch off its nuclear plants, but it gets all its power over the border from France. It's still nuclear power, by the way, um, just helps keep Germ German public happy because they don't think they've got nuclear plants on their soil. So, uh, on their soil. so um, it's a bit hypocritical. But there you go. But they've got, as I say, they've got, you think about a map of Europe and they've got interconnectivity on all sides. Let's look at the particular challenge in the UK now. I'm hope, yeah. This is a slide taken from National Grid's weekly transparency uh, forum in which they tell us what's been going on in the grid and how they've been handling it. This is quite an interesting one because it gives you some sense of what the grid has to do every week. What the grid has to do every week is get all that wind power down from Scotland following that red line into the population centres in England. And its problem is, is that everywhere there's a blue dotted line, it's got a constraint, which means that sometimes it has to turn off Scottish wind because it can't get the power south because there just isn't enough capacity in the north south transmission links. There is um, a new high voltage connector that's been built in the last three years down from Strathclyde into North Wales, that's called the Western High Voltage Interconnector. Um, that's been a, a help for sure in um, uh, managing the constraints, but um, it, it's, a, it's a challenge in the UK, you know, we, where we generate most of our power is not where we, the demand is. And of course you lose, um, you lose power on transmitting it. And some of the non-energy charges we pay in our bills are because we're having to pay transmission losses. Uh, in the bills. So those um, three graphs on the left really show um, how well the, how constrained those uh, those boundary points have been through the year. Um, B2, B4 has been, been the, the really tight one, as you can see. The other ones haven't been too bad. They've had their moments when they've been a bit low, but by and large, not bad. But this is quite interesting for us because when we think about where we want to site a battery, Obviously, it makes sense to site a battery behind a constraint, because if you've got wind blowing up in the north, which can't get south, south at any point, store it in a battery, wait till the moment you can get it south. 
So I've, I've touched on storage. Let's talk about storage a bit. Um, storage is highlighted as a great panacea for um, renewable systems, and up to a point it is, but there is a duration issue with storage. Uh, well, with battery storage, let's be more precise. There are other types of um, storage which are being explored, which are still uh, to some extent uh, unproven. I'm thinking about compressed air in, in caverns. I'm thinking about um, super, um, super capacitors, which have got quite some potential, but they don't have great energy density, but they do have long duration. They do, don't have any de uh, degradation compared to a lithium ion battery. Um, and the other type of storage, which we've been using for a long time and we're building more, um, is um, pumped storage. Pump storage, I'm afraid, is nothing more sophisticated than pumping a load of water up a hill and then holding it up there till you need it and then letting it run down the hill and turn a turbine. Um, now, why we need storage is because the more we have renewables, we lose a lot of spinning reserve. What's that mean? Spinning reserve is what you get. If you turn off a big um, thermal generator, those turbines will keep spinning. You've probably been out to... Um, uh, once the power goes off, the turbines will keep spinning and there'll still be power coming from them, albeit in slightly, uh, you know, be less of it. But at least it's not a sort of binary moment in the grid when suddenly, bang, it's off, which solar is. You know, as soon as the cloud goes across the solar panel, that power's off. And this gives the grid quite some uh, some challenges in managing the grid because it, national grid, um, because they need to keep the grid at 50 kilohertz voltage, which means every time there's a little bit more demand and a bit less generation and we fall below 50 kilohertz, they need something that can respond really fast, like in three to 20 seconds. Uh, and batteries are great for that, lithium ion batteries. And every time there's a bit less demand and a bit more generation, we go above 50 kilohertz, they need exactly the opposite. They need something to take that power off for uh, 30 seconds, a minute. And so they've got all these different um, tools to manage that uh, voltage on the grid and batteries are particularly good at that but what batteries aren't good at is holding power and delivering it for more than two hours let's say um, and the other thing that we lose apparently with um, the loss of fossil fuel generation is um, inertia now I'm no physicist and I've I've had it explained to me in terms of pints of beer and froth on pints of beer uh, and that's about as far as I've got with inertia. But batteries are really good for inertia. Then we talked with we talked about um, grid constraints and lack of connectivity. Batteries are great for helping manage that. And then if you think back to that um, slide I showed right at the beginning of the um, three different um, voltages we have on the grid: the high voltage, the medium voltage, and low voltage. Well, one of the challenges that the local network operators are having now is that the more and more people get um, electric vehicles the more that they are worried about voltage crashes at the local level because if everybody comes in at six o'clock in the evening and starts charging up their cars that can cause a local voltage crash so having batteries at a local level on the 11 kv network can really help balance that dnos are not allowed to own batteries so it needs um, third-party providers to site batteries on the system locally and help them manage their grid. But they're not going to be able to do, until they start paying for those services, private parties aren't going to install batteries. And that uh, needs to be something that DNOs need to, to realize. At the moment, they're going for solutions like, well, if the voltage challenge, we'll just switch people's car charging off, which is such a 20th century solution. Um, they need to start thinking smarter and we're all going to have to get smarter because by 2025, um, all this, uh, we're all going to be um, metered at domestic level half hourly and we're going to be settled half hourly. And so instead of having one price for all your energy needs, unless you're in economy seven, you're now going to start getting pricing at different times of the day. And that's going to incentivize householders to use their power at different times of the day. And hopefully the idea of that is it will smooth out demand across uh, the full 48 hours of the day because we are get we get settled on a half hourly basis in the UK um, as a supplier. So the good thing is is that we, um, 
with with smart meters and all that stuff you heard from smart energy gb about get a smart meter it'll save you money is absolute rubbish it's absolute rubbish until we start getting um, time of day tariffs and incentives to change your load to different times of the day and um, smart kit to do that and there is a danger there that um, you know you get people left behind because they can't afford the smart kit and that's something off is going to have to think about but um, and the last thing of course is that people who've got um, solar panels at the moment most most of their um, solar energy can get spilt onto the grid they're at work the solar panels haven't got much demand to meet on the house and it spills onto the grid and it's, it's wasted but all of a sudden your um, pv investment can pick up a bit better if you've got a battery and you can keep the energy for yourself and use it in the evening so that was a real whistle stop tour of what's been going on in the market um, and why re renewables causes a problem and just to quickly give you some sense of why we've got such expensive prices is because we've got so much renewables on the system now is that gas plant doesn't run as much as it used to so gas plant doesn't price itself at marginal cost anymore i.e the price of buying x amount of firms that it needs to generate it prices itself on marginal cost and scarcity value because it needs to, at the moment when the grid needs them it needs to get the money in it needs to stay alive for the whole year so they run for far less hours than they used to but when they do run they will charge for running just so they can stay economically viable so yeah that's it for me and uh, i'll pass back to david brilliant thank you very much mark uh, for that uh, i guess a very topical and also quite interesting uh for someone like myself you know with, with, within energy it's always interesting to actually see how it all comes together and the, the challenges that we face uh, and some really um you know, important points made uh, which hopefully we'll cover within within my presentation going forward so once again yeah thank you very much um just to remind everyone there is question uh, we will be running a q a session at the end of the presentation so if there's any questions you have please pop it into the q a box and we'll come back to that um after the presentation so um I think as, as, as Mark's discussed and as we've seen within the last few slides, um, the future of energy will be a complex system with many moving parts. So the challenge, the first challenge is me to be able to present this within 15 minutes. Um, as you've seen, it's quite a complex conversation to, to, to digest and, and, and just shrink down to a, to, to a small webinar. We won't be doing it any justice, but what we'll be doing is just sort of touching on some points and really looking at the challenge that we have and also what businesses can do to sort of help meet that challenge. So first of all, I'd just like to coin the phrase, uh, totally stolen from The Simpsons, but I think it works really well. Energy is the cause of and solution to all of life's problems. Every day we continuously consume energy in one form or another, and, and the continued use of energy is having significant impacts on our environment through, through climate change and, and, and global warming in terms of the carbon makeup of our electricity. The problem we have is our infrastructure and way of life is now so heavily dependent on energy that we can't just remove it. We have to change how we make it, and most importantly, change how we use it. So as we can see, the current UK mix, as discussed by Mark, is generated by a variety of sources. But one of the biggest challenges is that at present, one of the largest contributors to, to, um, to energy is gas. So we have the choice between renewables and gas, and gas unfortunately makes up the larger proportion of that at the moment at around about 40%. So if we look at 2019 data, so the year after this, we were generating about 324 terawatt hours of electricity which was made up of 40 percent from gas 40 percent from renewables and around about 20 percent from nuclear and other other resources so as we continue to develop our renewable economy and structure we will then continue to shift this generation of electricity from a fossil fuel to a renewable source and wind particularly is one of the largest aspects to look at that because one of the as mark discussed it's one of the largest opportunities we have because of the potential that we can have if we were really sort of tap the full potential of wind However, one of the problems we have is shift of heating, and not just heating properties, but also the heat that's needed for industrial processes. So the contrast to electricity. So if we consider that 40% of the electrical mix is already made up of gas, and then we actually look at how much gas is used across the UK, another 870 terawatt hours of gas was consumed in 2019. One of the most significant challenges for the UK is actually how to generate the same levels of energy without using gas. So whilst, for example, switching to electric heating is one solution, 
But we also have to consider that switching to that large of an electrical load to be able to cover this much is just going to put further strain on an already struggling electric system. Plus, we also have to consider the, the additional amount of renewables that we'll need to put into the system to actually try and cover that. So one of the solutions that's currently being looked at is hydrogen, and particularly on the point that you know, as, a, as a technology, hydrogen is currently being investigated in, but it is still a technology of the future. It is still being looked at. So as we can see, there isn't going to be a single solution to the overall problem. We will have to invest heavily in a wide range of different technologies to meet these challenges uh, in order to create the energy that we need. And we've seen this in the, in the uh, government's 10-point plan. So there's 10 different options, 10 different solutions to one problem that we have in terms of how we generate low-carbon energy to continue to meet the needs that we have today. So really, the key part and challenge for businesses and us as individuals is actually the sheer amount of energy that we use. So one of the most needed outcomes, needed outcomes is the reduction of energy, which can be achieved through efficiencies, but also staff behavior. So as we can see, while we try to change the mix of how we produce their energy, if we can actually reduce the amount of energy that we need, we can help solve the other end of the problem, whilst we allow innovation and technology to solve the beginning end of the problem. So really working with many organizations, one key aspect that has come up time and with, with, with a lot of organizations is really just to understand the energy consumption in the first place. So actually understanding how much energy you need, what your energy is used for, that, that key starting block is really vital and then to actually de determine what changes you need to make. The opportunities that exist to each business will be different and individual, but we really need to understand that first point of actually how are we using our energy and how is that being made up. So getting to understand your energy bills is, 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 is uh, vital. And half-hourly data is king. I mean, from, as a, from, an environment, from an energy order to point of view, whenever I'm given half-hourly data, it's, it's amazing because you can really start to drill down in the data in a much, finer, in a much more granular, granular detail. So if you haven't got a half-hourly meter and there's an opportunity to get one, I would recommend you, you look to have a half-hourly meter installed as soon as possible. But importantly, that you use that data. If you have a half-hourly meter, it's really important that you go through that data as often as possible to actually look at, at different trends. And just to show you an example of this, so these are half hourly readings taken from, from businesses I've worked with in the past. So as we see on the left hand side, um, the first chart is, is a typical Monday in this case. So it's just a typical energy. You can see the dark line is the average used for, for Mondays for this building. And then you can actually see the, the spikes. So if you were to look at this, the, the organizer can actually see at these individual times, they're spiking above what would be considered average. So it just be to understand that one, was that spike necessary? Is that part of business activity? Is there anything that we can do to try and minimize that, to try to keep to within the average as much as possible? The one below it then, so on the Sunday, so this is actually after plant shutdown. So they only work Monday to Friday. There is nothing in operation between the weekend to, to, to the Monday again. But as we can actually see by going through the data at this level, is the periodic spikes that seem to still be occurring. So the question is, what is these spikes? What's causing these spikes? Are there systems that are turning on that shouldn't be? So again, the opportunity to really look at how the energy is being managed and where there's opportunities to actually um, reduce unnecessary waste. We can see that on the, what we call, sorry, uh, we can see that on what we call the heat map. So on the right hand side, we've, we've sort of looked at the energy consumption over the, the, uh, the, this is the three week data. And we've looked at when energy systems are firing. So the redder it is, the darker it is, the more energy is being consumed. Obviously, the, the greener and the darker that is, the less energy is being consumed. But interestingly enough, at this sort of two-hour clock mark, when the, again, the building shuts down, we can see for half hour, energy is firing. So again, this is an opportunity for a business to look at their data, look at how their energy is being used, and to, to identify this anomaly that potentially could be a timer and a pump or a timer and a system, which again, by switching off, they can actually cut their energy during that time by about half. So understanding your data, looking at your data, and most importantly is looking at your data against your business activity is so vital in terms of managing your energy and really identifying opportunities to make improvements. So just as we've been discussing with that, one of the biggest tips is what we call vampire load. So this is out of hours electrical use. So what we found, or certainly what I found by working with organizations and looking at energy data, is energy consumed outside of normal business hours, and bear in mind this doesn't apply to a 24-hour business because that would be a very different makeup, but what we find on average is about 30% of all the energy used is used when the business isn't in operation. So we think a third of all the energy you're paying for is actually when you're not doing any activity whatsoever. 
So where we've seen good practice with this, we've seen it as low as 18%. So it is possible, you know, with, with a bit of planning, with a bit of thought, and actually really looking at what happens after you shut everything down at night time to really think about how your energy is being used and where there's opportunity. So one simple solution would be to look at things like computers, printers, anything that's plugged in but still left on, even if it's on standby and it's energy saving standby, it will still draw power from the network. So really thinking about switching stuff off at plugs, shutting things down, and just making sure that anything left on overnight is what needs to be left on overnight um, to try and minimize that as much as possible. Because that's, that's a heavy, you know, 30% of your energy over a day to be consumed when you're not even doing business activities is just a significant waste of energy. Another thing for organizations to potentially consider would be management systems. So if it's possible to either look at a building energy management system, if that's something that, that's, if you're, you know, generally speaking for, for larger built businesses with, with multiple rooms or, or more complex energy systems, but even smaller businesses can actually install energy monitoring systems, sort of like the smart meter type systems, where it actually looks at and tracks your, um, tracks your data uh, and it helps you to actually break it down over the day so you can see where energy is being consumed. So as you're seeing with the graphs, if you can break it down at that sort of level and really look at it in that sort of detail, it just helps to understand how the energy is being used, when it's being used, where it's being used, and whether that's relevant to the business. One of the other aspects to think about is conducting energy audits. So that could be something you can do yourself or you can seek for third-party consultants to, to, to do that work. Large companies are required to carry out the ESOS, so the Energy Savings Opportunity Schemes, and that's conducted every four years. However, a similar scheme like that should be considered by all businesses, actually carrying out an energy survey of your organization at least every you know, four years, if that's the way you want to look at it. But it just means that periodically you're actually having a look at your energy systems and really making sure that they're operating as expected uh, and then trying to fine tune and make changes uh, when it's necessary. So. While I appreciate most organizations, so sector businesses will, will each have different problems and, and different energy challenges, but two of the key ones that we come across, which is relevant for most organizations, is lighting and heating. So just because of time, I'm just going to focus on these two uh, energy aspects. Uh, obviously, there's a, there's a much bigger challenge and, and conversation that can be had, but we just don't have time to go through everything today. So first of all, lighting. Um, a, a phrase I once heard, which I absolutely love, is the fact that the only efficient light is one that's not switched on. So lighting in its, by its very nature is an extremely inefficient electrical system. So even LEDs, while they are much lower in terms of their energy consumption, they're still a very inefficient technology. So as much as possible, avoid using it. You know, where it has to be used and ensure that it's the most efficient light. So, you know, if you have an upgraded to LED lighting, you know, that, that really is a sort of the, the, the very first quick win to make in terms of upgrading it. Now you can obviously look to invest and change all the lights at the same time, or even as lights fail, just replace them with LEDs rather than just continually to use the, the, the older sort of fluorescent and, and older lighting. Um, the other thing to consider is that light levels are correct. So, you know, the number of times I walk into to a business and you sort of look around and you think, you know what, it's really dark in here or oh, it's really bright in here. And that difference between what's required and what's necessary. So, you know, there is a, a guidance to how much light should be should be required. You can buy a, a, a basic light meter or, again, you can ask for a specialist to come out and conduct an assessment. But actually just measuring the amount of light in areas will help to better understand that do you have the right number of lights or the right types of lights. And again, switching to LED, LED provides a very brilliant white light, which is so much better than the older fluorescent and traditional lighting. Um, and you can actually use less lights per square meter than you would do with the older lighting as well. And in terms of lights being left on, so sensors, mechanical, so obviously working with staff or behaviors to get them to switch stuff lights off when they're not in rooms is, is vital, but things like movement sensors, light sensors, and other mechanical uh, systems you can attach to lighting just helps to should we say shave off the edges to really ensure the system is working as, uh, as much as possible. So for businesses, you have large receptions with, with, with large glazed facades where, you know, receive a lot of natural light. Again, you walk in and you look up and you see the lights are on, even though if you turn them off, you wouldn't notice the difference. So things like light sensors in appropriate places should be considered uh, and installed as a low cost option just to ensure that the lights only turn on when, there's, when they're needed to, rather than just because someone's gone in and turned on the light as a, as a moment of behavior. So just moving on to heating then. So building performance is vital for any heating system. So if your building performs poorly, so you have low level of insulation, the energy system will have to compensate. And, and this unfortunately leads to inefficiency. So 
One of the biggest challenges we have in the UK is insulation of buildings, you know, whether domestic, as, as you've seen recently with the, um, the, uh, the, the demonstrations, um, but also on, on a business level. You know, better insulation is needed. Unfortunately, it does come with a high investment cost, and, and that does tend to lead to sort of longer paybacks. The thing to consider, however, though, is that in terms of building the need for the future, it is something that will have to be addressed at some point. And realistically, the sooner you can address that challenge and that problem, the better. So the thing is, when a building performs well, the energy system needed can be smaller, which reduces cost of investments, but also reduces the amount of energy that needs to be consumed and the efficiency. When you invest in any plant, it's a 15-year investment. So whenever you're considering your planning in terms of what you want to do, you need to consider that any plant you buy, you have that plant for at least 15 to 20 years. So if you are going to make changes to the building, the sooner you can make those changes, the more efficient system you can put in in the first place and, and actually compound the savings that you can achieve in, in the longer term. So within the slide, just things to consider in terms of heating. Um, you know, space heating and hot water can, can actually be one of the largest energy consumers for most businesses. And then it's really just to think about what type of heating do you need? How is the heating managed? What kind of timers do you have? Do you have external temperature sensors? Do you have internal thermostats? Are you able to zone your heating? The other side of it is district hot water. So not all businesses need a domestic sized tank of water providing them, particularly if you're in an office environment and you're only hydrating or sanit you know, sanitizing. That's all your water need is for. Look at point of use heaters. So you can remove the old tanks. A loss of energy goes into heating hot water tanks and storing it. And as that heat gets lost, it continually tries to, to heat the system up. So by replacing older district heat networks with modern, more point of use systems, again, in the right organization, it's, it's, it's best to actually get someone in to, to have a look at your water needs and, and a plan accordingly. But there's an opportunity for a lot of businesses to actually save quite a bit of energy in the long term. So as I just discussed, continuing on the theme, it's really important that you look at things like timers, heating schedules, uh, and, and as much as possible actually to, to try and look at external systems to add them to, 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 your, uh, to your program. So one example of that is with heating. If you can get an outside air temperature sensor to actually plug into your boiler, what it does is it measures the outside air temperature and adapts the heat of the boiler to offer the best heating inside. Now, the benefit of that is it makes the system proactive. So most heating, the way it works is when the temperature drops, it heats, it puts the boiler up, heats the building again, and then turns off again. If it knows what the outside temperature is, it can actually adapt how it heats internally. So it can actually preempt the changes that are going to be made inside and actually use less energy to keep the room at the right temperature rather than reacting to the temperature changes that can happen throughout the day. So by just simple things like additional sensors and, and really just thinking about timers and when you need the heating and when on as well. And, and again, sometimes people put timers on and then just forget about it. Again, on mild days, if you can or you're able to, actually dropping the heating down on milder days when it isn't needed is, again, another way to just making the system more efficient. Um, some of the other things as well is just to consider, you know, measuring the temperatures with thermostats. So actually putting thermometers in place to actually check the levels of rooms, particularly for businesses that don't have zonal heating. You know, cheap, low, you know, just low cost um, temperatures, uh, thermostats, thermometers, sorry, putting them into rooms to actually measure the true temperature of the room will help you actually adjust how much you need to uh, change the heating across the building in order to make it efficient throughout. Um, and one of the key things is that, you know, really trying to keep the temperature of the system as low as possible. Obviously, there are going to be needs depending on the organization, as we can see from the, um, from the, from the data they're taking from SIPSI. Um, however, you know, where you do have problematic areas with some staff, it's actually worth thinking about, well, how can we either localize that heating problem for that person, whether you create one warm and one cold room and separate the people accordingly, or whether it's just a case of you set the temperature and just ask staff to, to think about dressing appropriately or, or managing differently. One of the things I've seen in, in all the years I've been doing this is I've never met a building or business that has been able to solve everybody being warm at the same time or everybody not being too hot at the same time. There's always going to be differences in thermal comfort based on individuals. Uh, and unfortunately, there's no single solution to solving that. So finally, just in terms of alternative heating options. So, um, you know, where, so, so as we talked about in terms of the gas, so switching to electric heating, th th there's two real options to think about. And again, whenever I see a business, one of the things I always consider is what type of heating is necessary. So one technology that has been around for some time is infrared panels. Um, 
the consideration is whether you need to heat the entire space, which is often considered as necessary. But I always ask the question is how much of the how much time is actually spent in the entire space. One of the benefits that infrared panels have is that it's useful for heating problematic areas. So they're ideal for secondary heaters. So if you have a building that's, you know, in terms of the gas network, it's running off central heating, but there's still problem areas, which is still too cold. Rather than forking out on a convective heating, which actually uses quite a lot of energy, you can use an infrared panel in these places to actually heat the individuals. Um, they're much more efficient than, than convective heaters and will actually offer a very good solution at a, at, um, at a much lower running cost. They also isolate individuals. So if you do have an area where there's one person who's really cold and everyone else is quite comfortable, again, the, the IR panel heats the person directly, which means it doesn't actually impact with the rest of the system. And that, that could be quite useful if you have air conditioning heating where you don't want to introduce a secondary heat source, which will throw the temperature. So if you do have air conditioning heating and there's still, you know, individuals who are cold or areas that are cold, you can use infrared panels to sort of deal with these problematic areas, minimizing the amount of energy used while still actually uh, providing good thermal comfort across the, the site. And then finally, with, with heating heat pumps. So lots of talk at the moment going on around switching, you know, from gas to heat pumps. And again, it's a technology that every site visit, particularly lately, I, I've been to, people are asking about heat pumps. So the, I guess the biggest part to consider for heat pumps is the limitations. So these are low temperature heating systems. So a boiler will heat water up to about 80 degrees, 70 to 80 degrees, depending on the system and that will provide the heat across the central heating system. Now, heat pumps only heat to around about 50 degrees. In fact, the lower the heat, so 30 to 40 is ideal. And if you can actually get the heat generated about that much, it actually makes the system far more efficient. Every time you push that temperature up, you just drop down the efficiency of the system. The problem this means is that it isn't always the best solution for every building. So if you are in a very leaky building, an old, old building with, with very poor insulation, while you could look to install a heat pump, what you have to consider is that you probably will look to oversize the system to actually manage the difference between the low temperature heating and just the poor, shall we say, containment of heat within the building. Unfortunately, that means a larger plant, which means a much higher cost of investment. So if you are thinking of heat pumps, it's a case of actually thinking about your building performance first, investing in building performance to get that up to standard, then looking at low cost uh, heating through heat pumps um, to actually then tackle the other end of the, the, the challenge as well. So renewables, so, so we touched on this with, with Mark and some really good comments uh, made on that. Um, you know, wind is certainly something that the UK has uh, has a lot of, but as Mark has explained, it is very uh, intermittent at best. So there's times when we have a lot of wind and times when we don't have a lot of wind. You can look at more local wind solutions. The, the thing to consider, however, is that they're not always, so, so anything that's building level, there's a lot of turbulence that's generated. So ideally, you want to try to get your wind turbines as high as possible. However, that's not always possible in, in, in uh, certainly in urban areas where there might be planning restrictions for you putting in a, a, a sort of a tall wind tower. Uh, solar panels are something we all know and something we're actually seeing an increase of investment through. The key thing with solar is to match the size of the array to the business need. So just because you have lots of roof doesn't mean you need to fit it. Ideally, what you want to do is match how much solar array you put on to how much energy you're actually consuming. You know, any sort of spillover, as Mark termed this, or any export into the grid is only going to pay you around five pence, where the actual cost of you buying the electricity is between 15 to 20 pence. So as you can see, it makes much more commercial sense to utilize and, uh, and use as much of the generated energy as possible rather than paying it into a grid at a much lower cost. The idea being that you can always add more as your energy systems change. If you increase your energy demand, you can then add solar onto it, but you can't necessarily take it away. Uh, battery storage. So something that must be planned carefully. It doesn't always work for small scale. Um, certainly it is needed on, on, on the larger scale as discussed by Mark, but within an individual business, where we've really seen these work well is if you have later needs for energy. So for nightclubs, bars, et cetera, if you have solar array where it's not open during the daytime, all the energy you generate, you store, and then you use that energy at nighttime when you are actually in operation. And again, the same with sort of 24 hour businesses. Most organizations actually work during the daylight when the, when, the sun, when the solar PV is generating energy and will actually use most of the energy they generate. So there'll be very little sort of overflow that will charge a battery. And as Mark suggested, you can't really keep that energy till the winter because one, you won't be able to store enough of it and two, it just won't store long enough. And by the very beginning of winter, you'll have used all your store anyway. Uh, and then biomass, so certainly this is an option for businesses who need a very high heat demand or places that are not on oil networks where heat pumps just won't work, so for older buildings, et cetera. 
Um, and it's just sort of a key solution that we've seen where if as an organization you have a lot of waste wood, like pallets and stuff that are really difficult to recycle, you know, putting in a biomass that can deal with that waste wood and actually convert it, although you do have to check on the type of wood, um, but that is, there is a solution in doing that and actually putting in a biomass system to provide your heat whilst also then dealing with a, a, a sort of a problem waste as well. So um, I apologize for the time. I'm just going to run through this very quickly. So one of the key things is that there is generally grant funding available, um, and it's available to help catalyze capital investments in energy efficiency and uh, renewable energy initiatives. There are different schemes covering different geographical areas, and the eligible, the eligible technology list does vary between some schemes. So not all technologies will be suitable under all um, funding schemes. One common requirement is that the project will seek to either have a beneficial impact in terms of either energy reduction or carbon. Some might actually be tied into other requirements. So for example, some community funds will actually require the investment to go to supporting communities rather than actually looking at uh, energy efficiency. So there are sometimes sort of requirements that each fund will have. Most of the projects and most of the funding that we deal with is uh, ERDF, or European Regional Development Funding, uh, and sort of the detail in there in terms of what businesses need to be in order to be uh, suitable or, or eligible for those, um, those funds. Now, unfortunately, we couldn't cover the entire UK. There's, these are some examples of funding within the east of England, but what we would say is there is generally funding available nationally. Speak to your local growth hubs, speak to your local authorities, and just ask them for any information they have on any sort of funding that's available within your area uh, and really look to seek any sort of energy efficiency grants and just understand what they're, 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 uh, is available through them. Um, we've also seen some funding come from uh, old landfill sites that have been converted or large energy installations such as wind farms where the company set up to manage them have also set up uh, funds to invest into the local community as part of the work in which they're doing as well. So again, if you're in a sort of an area, it's worth having a look online uh, and just seeing if there's any funding available through those methods as well. And then just finally, in terms of the case studies, this is a business that we worked with. Um, they had a very problematic, as you mentioned, in terms of the reception area. There was a lot of through traffic in the receptionist, no matter how high they turned the heating up was, was freezing every day. And what we actually found and suggested was you put infrared heaters into the reception. Certain places in the workshop areas where they only needed workstation heating, so rather than heating the whole space. And we also found a, a, an opportunity to improve their air conditioning system with a better climate control, as well as LED and other, other sensors. By making the changes, they were able to save about £4,000 per annum and about 12,000 come to start, uh, 12 tons of carbon, uh, and also helps just improve the experience. In fact, I think we heard back from the reception station, she loved the panels and it was the best thing they'd ever done. So again, just thinking about the type of uh, the technologies you can put in will be, will be useful as well. So that's it from me. Um, I'm just gonna open it up to uh, questions. Uh, again, um, Please feel free to put any questions in. Just because of time, we'll, we'll just run through a, a few of these uh, while we can. So it's a question for Mark. Are you with us, Mark? Yep. Brilliant. So uh, the question is, what innovations are on the horizon to help with the shift to renewable generation? Um, I've heard about technologies that use car batteries to be plugged in. So one to charge, but then also to go back as a, as a sort of a moving storage device. Mm -hmm. um, but are there other big changes on the horizon? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a mistake to characterize our problem as needing new innovations. The problem is, is, we, we, um, is that policymakers haven't really um, thought out how to adapt our system to the 21st century. We've got a 20th century grid and a 20th century way of doing things. And um, if there had been better planning of, um, transmission and grids and so on then we wouldn't quite be in the fix we are um it, but we've had such piecemeal policy in this space it's sort of been it's really helped this this problem come about so in the first instance you know we we you know the biggest thing was we sort of thought oh liquefied natural gas lng is often caught, heard it called was deemed to be you know as long as we had lng there was going to be no problem there was so much of it washing around the seas we'd always have gas it was dead cheap and no one really paid any attention. There was a really interesting little in, um, intervention by Dieter Helm on the radio this morning. Um, and he talks a lot of sense in this space. We didn't, gas is always going to be a transition fuel, but that doesn't mean that you don't change the way you're doing things. You, um, and you don't um, price off the 
most um, expensive last megawatt of power. Um, you know, renewable energy is cheap. And all that's happening is that this gas price that's setting the price of the whole system means that every renewable generator is making money hand over fist because, of course, they don't have a marginal cost. Um, so this, the, the, probably the biggest innovation we need is a system redesign. Absolutely right. No, it's a very, very interesting point uh, to make as well. Just just on the topic, so one comment that's come through is, are you able to comment on the new green gas mill Ecotricity is doing? Um, yes, I mean, our challenge with green gas mills, um, and I hate the word gas mill, by the way, but anyway, uh, it's, it's, I haven't coined that phrase. Um, but if, if we're talking about anaerobic digestion by any other name, um, the only comment I make is that we have more of a challenge than most people because of our um, feedstock issue. And our feedstock issue means we cannot use anything coming from um, anaerobic digestion from animal manure. and to be honest that's not a huge source anyway in this country because we don't tend to have feedlots um you know massive feedlots for uh, farm animals like they do in uh, in the continent in particular um, we've always had really good free-range pigs in this country but for our own gas mills um there will be basically agricultural residue and waste um and chippings that anything that's not uh, animal derived and hasn't got a huge you know it's got to come from within 20 miles it can't come from a long long way away i mean that's the joke about drax's um biomass plant that they get uh, um renewable subsidies for i mean they're shipping wood in south georgia and shipping it all the way across um the atlantic for uh, from using a sector um, maritime which doesn't have any eu obligation i mean it's a, it's a disgrace so that whole transport of uh, feedstock issues something really needs to be looked at and something that we will be very cognizant of when ours gets off the ground okay no, thank you uh just one just because of time apologies uh we, we may run a little bit late uh but obviously we'll try to get through as quick as we can just one last question that was that was raised actually for myself um does iae have a checklist of energy saving things to do prioritized by cost or energy saving in practical businesses um yes we do have a checklist of energy saving um i guess some suggestions that can be that can be made that which we will be able to make available uh with this presentation at the end as well but we, we'll be able to provide that for IAE members just to give a summary in terms of the different technologies to think about and perhaps different steps to take in terms of when to where when and where to prioritize um investment or even uh, changes to be made to to uh, make the most impact for you for your business as well so again, apologies for time, but what I'd like to do then, so thank, again, thank you very much, Mark, uh, for your time. I appreciate you, you, you need to go. So um, again, thank you very much for your presentation today. Yeah, thanks uh, very much uh, for having me. Time as well. No, for all. So thank you very much, cheers, all the best. Bye. Okay, so moving on to, I guess moving on to what today's really been all about. So in addition to bronze, silver and green accreditation, uh, we are also awarding IE member organizations for going above and beyond in seven special categories. The results will be announced throughout the week and at the IE Awards itself on Thursday. But today we're ready to celebrate the winner of our best carbon reduction category for 2021. Uh, many thanks goes to this category sponsor, Compare the Market for their support to help us make events, to help make this event possible. So for this category, we were looking for a reduction in absolute carbon relative to other IE members or averages for their sector, along with significant progress towards halving their carbon emissions since their baseline year and in alignment with net zero and sorry, and in alignment with national net zero emissions. We also took into account home looking emissions and investment in green technology. So I would like to hand over to our sponsor for best carbon reduction award, representing Compare the Market, David Webb. Thanks very much, David. Um, some great presentations this afternoon, so um, thanks to you and Mark for those. Um, it's a real pleasure for me to present the award for best carbon reduction. Uh, compare the market, we're looking to develop our plans to achieve carbon neutrality. So it's really inspiring to see that another company has, uh, has, has done so well here. Um, but without further ado, uh, I would like to announce uh, the winner of the best carbon reduction as Perkins Engines. Many congratulations, guys. 
Um, the judges were impressed with the scale and investment of the solar farm, the wider biodiversity and habitat improvements were also noteworthy, as well as using a redundant piece of land for conservation purposes. The judges also liked your onward ambition to increase sustainable energy production to contribute to on-site renewables to reduce resilience on the grid. So um, really, really well done. Yes, well done, Perkins. Uh, amazing um, uh, submission and for, for everything that you've done. Uh, I'd also just like to say thank you to everybody for attending today. Uh, thank you to Mark and, and uh, I guess myself. I'm here to thank myself. Uh, we also like to thank the Event of the Award sponsor, Compare the Market. So thank you very much, David, for, for coming on today and uh, for supporting this event. Uh, we'd also like to thank our other IE Award sponsors, uh, Green Energy Switch, Fourth Award Solicitors, um, BGL, Ecotricity, Davies, uh, uh, part of the Linnaeus Group, uh, Blueprint, and Cool Food Pro as well. So as I said at the beginning of today, um, if there are uh, more events running throughout the week. So if you haven't signed on, please sign on to the website. Some really interesting talks and topics coming up. Uh, these will be saved as webinars and available on our, on our website as well. So if you wish to revisit anything, uh, please feel free to, to, to access them. And if you have any questions about anything discussed today, uh, please feel free to contact us as well. So again, thanks for everyone's time. Apologies for running slightly late. Uh, congratulations to Perkins Engines again for, to, uh, for uh, winning this year's uh, award. And we look forward to seeing you guys at the events uh, throughout the week. So 